Good afternoon and welcome to the KLDS Connecting Education and Outcomes webinar session. My name is Jennifer Watchering and I am a partner of Rural Appalachia and will be serving as your host for today's webinar event. If at any time during the webinar you have any technical issues or questions, please feel free to chat with me by using the chat feature located on the right hand side and selecting host. Also, we'll be holding a question and answer session at the end of our time today, so please, as any of our speakers are speaking throughout the event, enter any questions you may have in the right-hand Q&A panel, and we'll address those as a group when we get to the end of the event. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the event over to Dr. Lou Young, who is the research scientist for Rel Appalachia, who's going to be providing the welcome and the introductions for today. Lou? Thank you, Jennifer. This is Lou Young, and it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon um, to tell you a little bit about the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System, KLDS. The title of our presentation today is Connecting Education and Outcomes, and joining me are um, Dr. Kate Akers, the Executive Director of the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics, as well as um, Justin Otto, the Director of Marketing and Communications for the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics. Working on advancing the slides here. Thank you. Sorry about that. I have a few slides I want to share with you just quickly about REL Appalachia. We are one of 10 regional educational laboratories across the country, uh, administered by the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, in the Institute of Education Sciences. We are a regional education lab because we are responsive to the needs of our region. And as you can see from this map, there are four states in REL Appalachia, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Virginia. And our goal is to work with you to find better ways to teach and better ways for students to learn. Educational research can provide an important bridge for educational needs helping those of us in P12 rethink and reshape our practice to ensure students have the technical proficiency, critical literacy, and sophisticated problem-solving skills they will need in virtually every facet of their lives. We know that teaching can be informed and enhanced by reviews of the current literature, by better, more immediate use of data collected by states and districts, and by new research that answers questions yet unanswered about teaching and learning. So REL Appalachia stands ready to serve you as a regional partner, and we hope that we can provide other services for you as we move forward over the course of the coming months. Some examples of products that we um, share from REL Appalachia, as well as our fo focus areas, are listed here on the slide. You'll see that we provide analytical research, as I just mentioned, as well as technical assistance through hands-on workshops. Webinars, webinars like these and other support for schools and districts. We also do comprehensive literature reviews uh, upon request. Our focus areas are not, this is not a comprehensive list, but we do work around early warning systems, college and career readiness, which is really big in Kentucky, effective data use at the school and district level, as well as literacy and numeracy instruction and classroom technology. You'll see that it is data-driven, around practitioners and support for policymakers. And lastly, here in Kentucky, more specifically, we work through what's called the Kentucky College and Career Readiness Alliance. Several of you participating in today's webinar will see uh, partner organizations for your school and district, as well as higher ed institutions listed here. Central Kentucky Educational Cooperative, Green River, KVEC, Northern Kentucky, OVEC, Southeast South Central, West Kentucky, along with the Kentucky Department of Education and the Council on Post-Secondary Education are critical partners for us in the Kentucky College and Career Readiness Alliance. So that's a little bit more about Real Appalachia, especially for some of you who may not know our work very well. But more specifically today, for today, the reason you tuned in was to hear more about the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System. So our specific goals for today that we will accomplish over the next few minutes with you. And number one, to raise your awareness about the capabilities, products, and services that the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System uh, provides. And just to get our acronyms clear, Kate will do a good job um, clearing this up when we get to the formal presentation, but the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistic, Statistics administers the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System, and that's where we're going to take our deep dive today. 
Our second goal is to explore ways that school and district staff might use the system to improve decision making and long range planning. As a former superintendent here in Kentucky, I'm going to share with you toward the end what my experiences with the longitudinal data system were a few years ago. And hopefully that'll inspire some uh, opportunities for you guys to use the system as we move forward. We're also going to really look forward to hearing your questions and any feedback that you can share with us later on in the webinar um, so that the center, so that cases can know more about um, other reports that they might provide, tools that you may need in the field that they have, they could provide access to, as well as any additional training that you might need to support the use of the longitudinal data system back in your schools and districts. And lastly, as um, Jennifer mentioned earlier, we'll open up opportunities at the end for you to ask questions about the system, but also please take advantage of the chat here inside WebEx to pose those questions so that we can um, formulate those and distribute them as we move forward. We have a special guest who will be joining us today, and um, as you might expect, a very busy man, an important person in our world. He, we're, we're not sure that Secretary Heiner is actually available to us yet, but we hope that he is. If not, he'll be here soon. But Secretary Hal Heiner is Kentucky's Secretary of Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. Um, and Secretary Heiner, as many of you probably know, um, has firsthand experience in bringing jobs to Kentucky, as well as keeping jobs in the Commonwealth. He's been a successful businessman, and he's very um, open about his passion for education and public service. Secretary Heiner has long been focused on shaping civic policy as well as improving education and career opportunities for all Kentuckians. Now in his new role as Secretary of Kentucky's Education and Workforce Development Cabinet, he oversees the work of educating, preparing, and training Kentucky's current and future workforce. Secretary Heiner is a longtime Kentucky resident and has been an active community leader. He has served as Vice Chair of Greater Louisville, Inc., and in 2002, he was elected to the Louisville Metro Council, where he spent eight years focusing on finding efficiencies in services, government transparency, and innovative ways for the community to grow and prosper. Secretary Heiner, um, his private sector career began after receiving a master's degree in engineering from the University of Louisville. He then became a partner in a civil engineering firm that worked across Kentucky. He and his wife, Sheila, reside on a corn and soybean farm in Jefferson County, and they have four grown children. We are delighted and honored that Secretary Heiner uh, is able to join us today and to offer his word of greeting and his background with the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics. Secretary Heiner. Okay, we were a little worried about his schedule. Um, we anticipate that he'll be able to join us, so I'll make sure and know that we have introduced him uh, via his bio, and we'll uh, welcome him to join in on the webinar as soon as he's able um, to get here. In the meantime, we don't want to hold up the progress any longer, so I'm going to toss this over to um, the Executive Director of the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce, Dr. Kate Akers. <coughs> Thank you so much, Lou, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, we in, we um, anticipate that Secretary Heiner will be able to join us a little while later, and so I'm happy to turn that over to him as soon as he is available. First of all, I just want to thank Lou and her team at REL Appalachia for giving us this opportunity. The work that we do at Kate Booth, um, we're very passionate about it and we're excited about it, and and what, what gets us really going and, and, and looking forward to our work is by being able to connect with our key stakeholders. So each and every one of you represented on this call are some of our stakeholders, and we're really excited about this opportunity to not only share the work that we are currently doing, but also to hear from you about, uh, about some things that we can do to really help, help you with your strategic planning and with the goals for your different agencies. So what is the center? You've heard me say KSUS, um, the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics. You'll notice I paused there to take a breath before I began. Um, many of you have probably heard, of, heard about us from our former name, the Kentucky P20 Data Collaborative. That group began in 2009 um, as a collaborative education agency between the Kentucky Department of Education, or KDE, 
the Council on Post-Secondary Education, CPE, and the Education Professional Standards Board, EPSC. And those three entities came together and thought, wouldn't it be great if we could take the data and all of our three systems and unify it, and that way we could produce reports about students, teachers, graduates, all transitioning in between those three systems. So in 2013, we got a new name, which was the Kentucky Center for Education Workforce Statistics, and we pronounced that KSUS, which rhymes with couscous or Dr. Seuss. And the work that we do as an independent state agency is to maintain the P20W statewide longitudinal data system, which we call the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System, or KLDS. And then we don't just we don't just do this process to add all these different data together. We do it to measure and evaluate education and workforce programs at all levels throughout the state of Kentucky. I mentioned our legislation in 2013. That legislation does give us the authority to collect data from all of Kentucky's education and workforce programs. We are independent, meaning that in this case we are governed by a board. Secretary Hal Heiner is the Secretary of Education Workforce Development, as was mentioned earlier, and he currently serves as the chair of the KSUS board. And then the other education agency leads are also serving on that board, so that would be um, Commissioner Stephen Pruitt from the Kentucky Department of Education, President Bob King at the Council on Post-Secondary Education, Mr. Jimmy Adams with the Education Professional Standards Board, their Executive Director, and also Dr. Carl Rollins, who is the Executive Director of the Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority. This group comes together. So the, this is an example of workforce and education uh, leaders coming together to talk about not just data, but also the impacted policies of the data that the center produces. So we're very excited to have this group. They've been working together now for quite some time, and they really lead the direction of the center. So what are we tasked to do exactly? Um, I mentioned this idea of evaluating education and workforce programs throughout the state of Kentucky, and we really do that work to inform policymakers and stakeholders throughout not only the state of Kentucky, but also throughout the nation. All of you on this call represent some of those key stakeholders. And so as we go through, I hope that you will be able to see how the information that we're presented may help you in the work that you do. We develop state level metrics. And examples of some of these metrics might be establishing not just the high school, college, high school graduate college going rate, but the specific metrics that we use to establish that rate. So our office is able to produce statistics and metrics um, throughout the state using education workforce data. We also monitor privacy, confidentiality, and data quality. As we go through and we begin talking about some of the different types of data that we have in our system, um, I always mention that privacy and confidentiality are the most important work that we do. Um, when we talk about the data in our system, we're talking about my data. I'm a native Kentuckian, um, meaning I was not only born here, but I went to school here, I went to post-secondary here, and I now work in the state of Kentucky. So already you can see how, how the data related to me would be kept longitudinally, but it's also really important that we maintain the privacy and the confidentiality of the data. So that is some of as I mentioned before, the most important work that we do, and that comes first and foremost. Um, before producing any report, before any presentation, comes our emphasis on monitoring that privacy and confidentiality. In order to make the report to answer data requests, work with superintendents, such as the former superintendent um, Lou Young, we have to maintain a system. So our system is called the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System. It's one of the top longitudinal data systems in the country. So we are very proud of that and excited about that work moving forward. And what this means is this idea of longitudinal data, that we have a single record per person that gets carried on from early learning, K-12, into post-secondary or the workforce, and, and also goes back and forth between those different agencies. 
what we have next is uh, what I call a very complicated um, data diagram. We have a, um, a wonderful development team, and um, I think that they laugh whenever I show this diagram, but essentially we have data coming in from all of these key agencies all coming into the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce um, System into the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System. So what happens next is really important. So we take all of that data and of course we strip all of those identifiers away. So anything that would identify that it was my data um, or, or Justin's data, he's here with me as well today, all of that is stripped away and then we are able to produce different types of information and data requests based on the data in the system. So today we're gonna to hear about a very specific data request that our office fulfilled but we also do policy evaluation for individuals um, or school, school districts, universities applying for grants. We can serve as that third party evaluator, which is very helpful because we already have the data in the KLDS. We perform a variety of different types of analyses, um, not just policy evaluation, but also looking at um, some different programs and specifically how as data cross from agency um, to agency. We create a variety of standard reports that I'm going to talk about in just a moment. And then we also have customized reports. So as you see, um, as we produce data such as the high school feedback report, and sometimes we'd like to see that for a specific region of the state, we can also customize those to really help you address whatever specific population it is that, that you would like to address. Some of the data currently in our system, we've, we've already mentioned just a little bit, but in general, we collect data on public K-12 students, teachers, and staff. We have data on post-secondary education, and that would include our public and independent within the state of Kentucky, and also our, our proprietary college. We have a little bit of out-of-state proprietary data, um, as well as out-of-state post-secondary. We collect information on teacher and educator certification data, so what specific areas teachers are certified to teach in. And then we also have wage data and industry data as provided from the Kentucky um, Unemployment Insurance System. Right now, we believe that that data really captures between 80 and 100% of those working in Kentucky. So that would include any, any type of data primarily, or any type of employment that would have a W-2 with it. So we would be capturing that within our system. Some of our newer data is around kindergarten readiness. Most of you probably know that Kentucky is one of the few states, but not the only state that, that has a universal kindergarten readiness screener. So we do receive those data in our system. We also have data on career technical education. So they have a, their own data system, um, and we bring in all of that data. So we're able to see the impact of those career and industry certificates and industry recognized credentials as students transition into the workforce. We have information on financial aid from the Kentucky Higher Education Assistance Authority. So this would be information like your keys money um, and different types of loan programs and scholarships that students may receive. And then we also have information on workforce demand. So some of the, the most exciting work that we are beginning is about demand. So we all of the, the data that I've mentioned so far is all about the supply. So what does that supply look like in Kentucky? And now we're able to match that up with demand. So what are the most in-demand occupations and how does that vary by region? We also have information on health healthcare licenses, specifically from nursing and from EMT to begin to look at their specific workforce demand and how that aligns with the credentials in our system. And we just began a pilot program looking at Head Start data. So bringing in the Head Start data so we're able to see that connection into kindergarten readiness and then eventually into third grade reading and math and then continuing on through the education pipeline. On the right-hand side, you see a, a um, some examples of data that we are collecting in the near future. When I say near future, I mean primarily this fiscal year. So we are expanding 
our data in um, the data coming from the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, specifically around early childhood, so to be able to capture the data related to those specific students. We're working with the Department of Labor on identifying data about apprenticeships, and we are continuing to work on capturing more out-of-state and military employment. So with that, I would like to transition fairly quickly um, to Secretary Hal Heiner. So thank you so much, Secretary, for joining us today. Well, it's great to, great to be with you. I love to uh, uh, talk about CASUS and, uh, and its potential, especially as we look at uh, policy, the potential for policy changes uh, in education in Kentucky. Uh, you know, I came here about nine, almost nine months ago now, and uh, in any new position, uh, there's, some, there's some positives and there's some negatives, but the greatest positive of all has been uh, the surprising realization that CASUS is in the top, uh, certainly the top three uh, states in the nation in terms of longitudinal data systems. It's the go-to group for the federal government on how to best understand uh, policy changes uh, from a longitudinal standpoint. I love the fact that uh, we're able to uh, go back and see, you know, someone that got a B in geometry in their sophomore year and how much are they making today and, and what is that, you know, uh, what has that resulted in, that level of detail by tying it to our unemployment insurance uh, that's in the, same, uh, in the same cabinet here. So we have a full picture of uh, education. Did they go on to, did the student go on to post-secondary education and what are, what are they doing today and what, what kind of salary are they at? We have some really significant challenges uh, in Kentucky, especially in the workforce side. We rank 40, unfortunately, 47th in the country. Uh, and, and many commentators have said that's been because of our level of uh, education and skill levels of our graduates, and as we move to try to address uh, both education, post-secondary education and skill levels, um, I can tell you we will be looking in this cabinet to CASUS primarily uh, as we get a year or two out from policy changes on is it really making a difference in people's lives? Are they able to support themselves and a family? So I can't imagine after understanding what CASUS has available uh, to the Commonwealth for making policy decisions. I can't uh, imagine making those um, what maybe end up being bold decisions without the, being able to undo them, without being able to understand within 18 months, was it a good idea or was it a bad idea? We certainly don't want to hurt individuals. We want to help people move forward. So anyway, I'm thankful to, to Kate and her group. It's an experienced, uh, talented uh, group. I've always uh, noticed in the business world that when someone's at the top of their game, when they're really the best, uh, they can, one, easily understand, easily explain uh, uh, what the benefits are of a particular system and how to interact with it. And also they surprise you, surprise you with information you didn't think was available uh, in a very clear uh, and compelling format. And that's certainly uh, Kate and her team, uh, when they put out a report, it's easily uh, easily understood, and um, as we looked into the background on the reports, uh, they're just as strong. So I'd encourage anyone on the call that as you think about changes um, uh, within your system or want to better understand how your system compares to other like systems in the state, uh, just to use CASUS uh, fully. Uh, we're thankful they're federally funded and funded at a high level thanks to uh, their, their past great work and um, just would encourage you to, um, to make full use of this, of this tremendous resource we have in the Commonwealth. Thanks so much. Secretary Terry Heiner, thank you so much for, um, for your insights about the, the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics and also for your commitment to education and workforce in Kentucky. So with that, um, we would like to showcase just a few of the reports and, and talk about some of the, the different pieces that we have and then also what we plan to have moving forward. The first report that we would like to showcase today is the Early Childhood Profile. This is an annual report that's released every year in about February, and it is available for every Kentucky County, but the state-level report 
and also at the region level. This report provides information on not only kindergarten readiness, but what the population looks like prior to coming into kindergarten. So it can be used by principals and by community leaders to find out what their needs may be as these students progress through the education pipeline. It includes information on child care resources as well as additional assessments. This year in 2016 was the first year that we were able to produce the report looking at some more longitudinal data. And the report that's released this February will include information about kindergarten readiness actually tied longitudinally to third grade reading and math. So that's really a big step for this report and one that we are excited about for this coming year. We have a variety of other annual reports. I hope that some of you are familiar with some of these. Um, and right now, these are available on our website in PDF format, but also available in Excel spreadsheets. We produce a county profile report. That report looks at the key education and workforce metrics for every county, workforce area, um, as well as takes a look at Appalachian and non-Appalachian counties, so that we can really see what the education pipeline is, what the current industry makeup and the workforce looks like in each of those counties as well. We do a feedback report series. That the purpose of these reports is to offer feedback back to you, back to high school principals, superintendents, um, college, uh, post-secondary presidents, adult education directors. And this information is provided at the lowest level that we can provide it, meaning the reports, such as the high school feedback reports, go all the way back to the high school level. All of the reports that we have, as I mentioned, are available um, in kind of a, an easy way that you can just print them off as they are right now. We are transitioning into putting all of our reports out in a new dynamic reporting tool. So that will be rolled out. Some of them rolled out this fall, but many reports rolled out within the end of this academic year. So this report will allow individuals such as yourself to go in and do a little bit of data mining on your own. So you'll be able to see information about the counties, the school districts, the institutions that you represent, and then also see information about the other um, entities throughout the state. So you can do comparative analysis. So for example, if you're looking at high school uh, graduate college going rates, so you know what, what your rate may be, and then you want to see some similar high schools in terms of free reduced lunch population, um, maybe um, other demographics such as race, ethnicity, makeup, um, gender, and you want to be able to pull other similar school districts to you and then look at their college going rates to see what's going on in those other counties um, that may be able to inform the work that you do. So we're really excited about rolling out our feedback reports in this matter as well. We also do a variety of white paper and topical reports. One of our most recent ones is a, is a statewide look at the impact of career technical education certi certificates on the outcomes for those students. So the students that receive a career technical education certificate, so something that um, the Kentucky Department of Education would recognize, did they go on into post-secondary? Did they join the workforce? And then what were their wages? So I would encourage you all to look up that report as well. Some of the most powerful um, uses of data that we found is to put data in a map. So as I think about the state of Kentucky, I mentioned that I'm, in, I'm a native Kentuckian. I'm actually from Mercer County. Um, I now work in Franklin County, and then I reside in Fayette County. So my eye immediately goes to those, to those specific counties on any map that I look at. And we find that that's fairly consistent with, with all of the stakeholders that we meet. So this map specifically is showing us some information looking at kindergarten readiness and college and career readiness and how that varies by county. And this is part of a, um, some work that we've been doing, so we actually have some more updated data that could go on the slide as well. But the counties on this map that do not have any color are those that are below the state average in both reading I'm sorry, in both college and career readiness and kindergarten readiness. 
the counties that are yellow in color, and again, the county here will represent all of the school districts within that county. So those counties that are yellow, that indicates that the kindergarten readiness is at or above the state average, but the college and career readiness was below the state average. The counties that are green indicate that their kindergarten readiness was below the state average, but the college and career readiness rates are actually above the state average. And then the blue counties, both kindergarten readiness and college and career readiness are above the state average. So you can imagine a map like this we can do for any of the different types of data that are within our system. We can produce maps at not only the county level, but also the workforce area or the school district. I mentioned the early childhood profile. We have another um, report, and this is really the first report that we did um, as, as the P20 Data Collaborative, now as KSUS, and that is to show by high school those graduates going on to college. So this information provides um, feedback to um, high school principals, superintendents about not only who is going to college, but what their basic demographic breakdown is. And then we also produced a report on college success that says, okay, so they went to college, they enrolled in post-secondary, did they enroll the next year? And if so, what were their grades by subject area compared to their high school performance? And then we also show persistence into that second year. There's also, similar to all of our reports, there's an Excel spreadsheet, a data file available for any, for any of those that, that may prefer that format. So my contact information is here. Again, um, we are gonna have some questions, some time for Q&A at the end. And if you have a specific data request, the easiest way to send that in at this time is to email kcews at ky.gov. So with that, I'm going to turn the ball back um, to Dr. Lou Young. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, Kate, Justin, and I actually spent most of our spring going from educational cooperative to educational cooperative across Kentucky and had the chance to present a very similar uh, presentation face-to-face -face with superintendents, assistant superintendents, and other school leaders across the state. But it's really nice, Kate, to hear from you kind of bringing it all together very succinctly in today's webinar, so I appreciate that. And, of course, Secretary Heiner wasn't able to join us on our Rail Appalachia uh, road tour of the uh, cooperatives. So hearing from him today was a, a special treat. So thank you so much. I'm just gonna spend a few minutes with you, but for those of you who are school leaders, district leaders and administrators, superintendents, um, and others who have a hand in program evaluation, um, action research at the school or district level, I wanna tell you just about my personal experience with the, with the center. It was, um, Actually, I was superintendent of Jessamine County Schools, very proud superintendent of Jessamine County Schools from 2004 through 2013. And during my nine years there, um, we opened full day kindergarten for the first time in the district. Um, we were a large and growing district and um, frankly didn't have room to put all of those five-year-olds five in a full day program until we uh, opened um, a, a new school in 2002, uh, 2010, a, a renovated school district. But I also had a board who was concerned about um, the amount of money we were spending on full day kindergarten and frankly were holding me accountable for, um, for evaluating the program as we went along. So at that time, I had the opportunity to um, attend a very similar session to this one around what was, as Kate mentioned, called the P20 Data Collaborative and that's when I first learned about the longitudinal data system. So um, that's this project, uh, this program evaluation project grew out of my knowledge about the P20 Data Collaborative and how I might use them um, for a data project of my own in the district. So to give you some sense of what that entailed, in Jessamine County, as I mentioned, we did have um, half-day kindergarten when I became superintendent. That dated back to 2000 when we opened the Jessamine Early Learning Village and brought together all three, and four, three, four, and five-year-olds under the same roof. But the five-year-olds um, all 
came into half-day kindergarten. Um, Linda France, superintendent at the time, worked with our early childhood folks to conduct a lottery for three years, 2000, 2001, and 2002, to offer full-day kindergarten as a pilot program to up to 100 students per year. Other students who didn't win the lottery, so to speak, defaulted to the half-day kindergarten program in the district. So for those three years, we, con we conducted half-day kindergarten for most students and full-day kindergarten for a small group of random lottery-selected students who were interested in the full-day program. During my superintendency, we renovated the building and were able to then offer full-day kindergarten to all students starting in the fall of 2010. We, we did, however, continue a half-day offering for those families who wanted, to, wanted only half-day and not full-day for their children. So by um, the spring of 2012, um, I was looking at district finances. You know that Kentucky only funds half-day kindergarten. And we were also looking to evaluate the program that had begun in 2010. So I needed a lot of data at my fingertips, and um, my team and I decided we would contract or contact the Kentucky P20 Data Collaborative and ask if they could assist us in this process. And I need to tell you, you've heard today how sincere Kate is about the work they do and how passionate she is about the work they do. Um, I simply called Kate, introduced myself, and told her what I was interested in, and she immediately said, we can absolutely help you with that. So she helped me refine the research question around those three years of full day kindergarten cohorts in 2001, 2000 fiscal years one, two, and three. And so I said, so what if, what can I share with my board about what we know about those students, up to 300 of them, and how they're doing today in grades eight and 10? Um, we chose to look at the explore and plan test because we were looking to um, analyze any impact it might have had on college and career readiness for the quantitative piece. But I also conducted um, surveys of parents of full day kindergarten students in that year, spring of 2012. And I also conducted focus groups with current um, teachers at the Jessamine Early Learning Village, though seven of whom had taught both full day kindergarten and half-day kindergarten in the district. So you can see we're setting up the idea about what could I share with my board about potential impact as well as potential perceptions and preferences of full-day kindergarten in our particular county. What was so helpful to me was that Kate and her team, uh, immediately Kate assigned a data analyst to my project. And um, I'm talking very, very quick turnaround times on these projects. And they always make me say that I stop saying that I actually got some results like within 24 hours, but it's true. They're quite speedy in terms of um, supporting schools and districts with research data. So they were able to look back at 2000, 2000 uh, fiscal years, one, two, and three, and of the 85 students who accepted the lottery invitation to be full day kindergarten students that year in Jessamine County, 59 of them were still in Jessamine County Schools. In the second year, 94 accepted the offer, and 59 of them were still, coincidentally, in Jessamine County Schools. In 2003, 94 students were in that full-day kindergarten pilot program, and 54 of those students at the time that um, Kate and her team mined the data were still in Jessamine County Schools. So we were able to actually look at real kids um, 11, 9, 10, and 11 years later. So what we looked at then, um, I've probably skipped forward to this slide a little bit quickly. I went into this with the notion that there, we probably would not, in fact, be able to see um, any significant impact of full-day kindergarten on those particular college and career readiness tests. And in, that is in research terms, what they call a null hypothesis, and that null hypothesis turned out to be correct. I could not trace a significant, statistically significant difference in the performance of those full-day kindergarten students compared to their half-day kindergarten peers. 
there's a lot of reasons for that. Namely, the program wasn't targeting college and career readiness. So we didn't have a, a, a thread that ran through the program that would lead to um, any expected change in explore and plan scores. And obviously, so many years le later, a decade later, there were variables far beyond the control of the district. And it would have been almost impossible to isolate full day kindergarten with a causal effect on student college and career readiness. It wasn't a bust. It wasn't a waste of time or energy because we were we could, we were able to say thanks to the analysis that was conducted by the data collaborative that um, in fact while there wasn't a statistically significant difference there certainly was um, some students in the full day program outperformed their half day peers other students didn't but there certainly caused no harm but as I mentioned I was surveying parents and talking with teachers all along the way. So the qualitative side of things really kind of um, sealed the deal for me in terms of my recommendation to the board. Um, kindergarten teachers overwhelmingly preferred full day kindergarten as the best um, readiness preparation for primary school for five-year-old children. They did note, however, that there were some five-year-olds who um, would likely benefit just as much from half-day kindergarten, uh, typically characterized as those students who had well-educated, stay-at-home mom or dad, uh, families who were able to provide rich outside school experiences for their students, including private lessons, day excursions, family travel, et cetera. But by far for the default option, uh, kindergarten teachers said full-day kindergarten was a better choice. And as you can imagine, parents, and families overwhelmingly preferred full day kindergarten over half day kindergarten. They saw it as a better fit for their family in terms of half day child care issues, as well as they saw their children flourishing in the Jessamine Early Learning Village in the full day kindergarten programs. So the end of the project was for me to make recommendations to my board, and I have just two slides to show you here. Based on all of this information, my recommendation, my strong recommendations to the board were to continue offering full day kindergarten as the default option for Jessamine County students. But we also valued the half day opportunity for families who chose such a program. So the variety was something that we felt strongly about. We also um, recommended that we should explore other kindergarten alternatives, such as an early five program and opportunities for students who might need additional intervention in early childhood in order to level the playing field. And now, as you've seen Brigant scores come out over the last several years in the state, that's bearing out as an important option. And lastly, my recommendation to the board was if at any point funding were to become an insurmountable challenge that we should always explore full day kindergarten for chil children of poverty in the district. And we do know that uh, I conducted a literature review at the time. You've probably seen these same uh, research points that um, children of poverty benefit significantly more from full day kindergarten than than children who are not eligible for free and reduced lunch. So this is just an example, one district story about how I made a phone call to a girl named Kate and said, I need some help um, with some data. What could you do for me? And um, the amount of support and the level and quality of support that I received from the team at the time made me probably the biggest fan of the Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics as possible. So they laugh at me when I tell people all the time that I'm the KSUS cheerleader. If you have questions about this study or information that you would like to know, I know I just really gave you sketchy information about it. I just kind of wanted you to see a real life application. Please don't hesitate to ask those questions in the chat feed. As we did the um, cooperative roadshow this spring, um, Justin did a great job of keeping up with um, all the questions that superintendents or superintendent designees posed to us over the course of the spring, things that we hadn't perhaps thought of actually building into the presentation. So we've chosen a few salient questions from our audience in the spring that might be on your mind as well. And Justin is gonna share those questions with you and a response just to give you some idea about some other granular services that KSUS provides. So Justin, passing the baton to you and I'll advance to your next slide. Thank you, Lou. Um, 
I appreciate everyone logging into the the webinar. Any chance uh, that we get uh, as a team at Casey's to talk about the work that we are so passionate about, uh, we really get uh, excited. We're most of our team here as Kentuckians, so uh, not only do we believe in the power of data, but we also are really proud of the work that we do to help uh, the Commonwealth. So. Uh, like Lou said, my name is Justin Otto. I am the Marketing and Communications Director for KSUS. Uh, we had a great time this summer going from uh, co-op to co-op across the beautiful, our beautiful state of Kentucky uh, and able to meet many of the, the superintendents uh, within uh, our public school systems. Some of those questions that came up, one was, how much does it cost to run a customized report for a school district? Uh, there is no charge at this time. So, we realize that school districts across the state are, uh, one, they're trying to be efficient, they're trying to make the most out of their, the money that they will receive, and they may not have data scientists or researchers on staff. That's where we come in. So in the previous slides, you saw email addresses for both Kate and myself. Uh, if you have an idea or you're, you're sitting in your office right now and you're thinking, I've got this great program that I need funded, uh, but I've got to prove that it's working. How can I do that? Uh, how can the data that KSUS has help me either receive grant funding or, or remain uh, receiving the grant funding that you've already got uh, for some programs that you're really uh, passionate about and believe in? Um, we are going to be able to, one, work through that research question with you to make sure that it's correct, and two, uh, pull that data, uh, like I said, free of charge. Our second question is, how are independent districts treated in terms of published reports? Uh, we can look at independent districts. So a lot of those, uh, one of the reports that Kate talked about, uh, our signature report, our bread and butter is the high school feedback report. Um, that's broken down by one public high school graduating classes uh, and also by school districts. So again, uh, we're excited a lot of cases, but we're really excited about this new dynamic reporting tool that we've got called Tableau that we're going to uh, unleash on everyone in the near future. With that tool currently, uh, if you go to our website and you download our, our reports, they're in either PDF form or Excel. Uh, not very exciting. Um, our new Tableau dynamic reporting option is a superintendent, um, a school principal, uh, or a member of the public will be able to go to our, our website and look at that report and say, uh, you know, I know I'm in the region of northern Kentucky, and that's where I, I grew up. And uh, you can say, you know what, I'm from my district is uh, – uh, Newport Independent School District, and I know the districts around my region, but what would be really helpful is to try to find other school districts within the state of Kentucky uh, that are like mine, so that I can compare mine through demographics and see, hey, are they doing things that maybe I could do better, and we can share ideas instead of trying to recreate the wheel each time. Again, we understand that you guys uh, on this call, and uh, one, we're proud of the work that you do, but we know that you're spread thin, so uh, you want to use your time efficiently, and that's one way uh, to do it. The third question, could the center look at students in my district who took dual credit courses and compare them with students who did not? That's a great question that you could ask, and yes, we could. Uh, again, it's questions like these that you can you can ask us, go through those email questions, email addresses first, and come to us and say, hey, I want to compare to see if it makes sense, not only with dual credit, but other, other programs to say, uh, can I look at one, court, one cohort compared to the other or one group compared to the other? And absolutely, uh, we can help you walk through that. Fourth question, what kinds of data quality measures does the center take? So first, uh, we want to thank all of our uh, administrators and, and, and public school uh, officials and workers because without the hard work, uh, they put in to make sure that we get accurate data, we wouldn't be able to work, do the work that we do. So thank you so much for really starting uh, on your end to make sure that we can, again, provide you with the best possible data so that you can make uh, better informed decisions. Um, we also, again, it's I know Kate went over this, but quality and confidentiality are our top priorities. So uh, I'm a Kentuckian. Uh, my brother lives in Kentucky, my sister lives in Kentucky, my parents live in Kentucky, um, and while I work for cases and believe strongly in the work that we do uh, and how we are helping policymakers make better decisions, better data-driven decisions, I also believe that that data is about me. 
It's about where I grew up, where I worked, uh, where I went to school, and it's important to me to keep it private and confidential. So we have a very strict uh, confidential privacy uh, process that we go through. Uh, there's actually a uh, – we are proud that we are a leader within states and long, longitudinal data systems by saying we have something called – uh, the Kentucky Matching Solution. When we, so when we receive data, it's matched and stripped with all personal identifiable information. So when a researcher looks at data or uh, to, to start grouping things together or answer your research questions, they have no idea who they're looking at. There's, no, there's nothing on there that says first name, last name, social security number, address. Uh, it's all uh, just numbers and letters. Uh, and that's important to me, just as it is important to everyone uh, in Kentucky. Question five, what should I do if I think there are inaccuracies in my district uh, slash school reports? Contact us. There's a, you can go to our website and give us a call. You can email us, and we can either walk you through some of those inaccuracies and say, well, this is what that actually uh, means, or say, oh, man, we, you know, maybe we did make a mistake. Let us take a look at it, and we can, uh, we can respond to that very, very quickly. Because, again, uh, we are very appreciative of other people making sure that we are providing the best, most accurate data so that policymakers, practitioners, and the public can make better informed decisions. Question six, can the center aggregate data at the cooperative level to produce regional reports? Absolutely. We can aggregate data on, on several different regional levels, state, county, Appalachian counties versus non-Appalachian counties, uh, school districts, co-ops, uh, we can do that for you. And now I'm going to turn it, uh, first thank you again so much for, for letting us speak again. When we have a chance to share about the work that our team is so passionate about, we jump at that opportunity. So thank you, Lou, for giving us that opportunity, and I'm now uh, passing it back to uh, Lou. Thanks so much, Justin, and I hope those um, questions if they were on your mind, um, that you were able to receive those answers. If not, please feel free to type those in the chat message or Jennifer will open it up for your questions here in just a moment. In addition to support for schools and districts, um, you can imagine that KSUS is often called upon by lots of other organizations, including governmental officials, and uh, to provide various reports. Two of, that are very near and dear to us with REL Appalachia are two recent reports that we have available. One on dual enrollment courses in Kentucky, a very comprehensive look at high school students' participation and completion rates in dual credit. Um, KSUS was a key data provider and minor for us in that work, uh, invaluable in terms of the time that they saved us to be able to put together that report. And we also have a comprehensive uh, report on teacher retention, mobility, and attrition in Kentucky public schools in a time period from 2008 to 2012. Those links are there. You could also Google those by titles and find those two REL Appalachia reports, both of which were significantly supported by the data team at um, Kentucky Center for Education and Workforce Statistics. At this point, I think Jennifer is going to walk us through the um, question and answer period that we have time before we finish up today. Yes, um, thank you, Lou, and thank you to all of our speakers today. It's been an extremely um, valuable hour of information, and we do have a few questions from attendees um, as they've been listening in. The first one is regarding employment of teachers, and the question is, is there a way to get employment data from parochial or private schools? That is a great question and one that we continue to explore. Um, if you are a uh, parochial or private school and you would like to contact us about including your data in the, in the current system, we're happy to talk to you about that. But at this time, the majority of our data um, that's K-12 comes from the Kentucky Department of Education. Um, we do have some aggregate level information as well as some information about students from those high schools that go into post-secondary but we don't really have enough data at this time to provide like a high school feedback report, for example. Okay, thank you. The next question is asking if KSUS has a readily available data variable workbook for researchers. We do. We um, have one available. We are in the process of revamping our website to make it a little bit easier to find, actually. But if you are interested in that, you can email 
kcews at ky.gov, and we'll get you our most recent copy of that. So we call it a data dictionary. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, is it possible to link cases data with, uh, with other data sets, like American Community Survey, through some sort of common identifiers? We do have that ability. So um, some of the evaluative work that we have done and that we continue to do, we bring in um, identifiable data from another source, and then that will go back in through the development process and be linked to our system. Um, and then we do remove all of those identifiers before the researchers are able to use it um, in, in any way. Data like the American Community Survey, um, we get that in aggregate, so we do not receive identifiable data that we could then link to individuals in our system. But when it comes to looking at data at the county level, um, a lot of the data from the ACS, the American Community Survey, is currently in our county profile. Okay, the next question. Um, do you have a sense of what the typical turnaround time is on a data request? That all depends on what's being asked. Um, and if, you know, there's, depending on the different types of data that may be requested or the format, it may take longer. So we can turn um, a request around in as little as three weeks. We do have to um, give any of the agencies that originally provided the data to get 10 business days to review the request to make sure that we aren't violating any of their privacy or confidentiality rules. Um, and then usually it, it can take us as few as a couple of days to pull data. Some, some larger projects that may require a memorandum of understanding, if individual level de-identified data are being exchanged, that process can take a little bit of time. So we have to have that agreement in place between the requester and KSUS, but also um, in partnership with our other agencies. Okay, the next question, does the post-secondary data contain proprietary institutions in the state? Yes and no. Historically, we have had proprietary institutions. Moving forward, we are exploring some different options. Uh, we used to have the National Student Clearinghouse is what we use. We no longer use them um, to, to get that specific type of data. But we do collect data from Kentucky's eligible training providers, and that would be any of our post-secondary institutions, which would include quite a few proprietary institutions that are receiving federal money related to the Workforce and Innovation Opportunity Act. So any schools that are receiving that money submit all of their individual level data to KSUS um, so we can perform their evaluation. Okay, and I think we have time for a couple more. Um, what is the capacity, what is your capacity in terms of full-time employees dedicated to LDS? Everyone in our office right now is fully dedicated to the KLDS. We have 23, I believe, staff members. Um, about nine of those are full-time researchers. Okay, and um, let's see, both, I think both of these are the same, but can researchers um, and faculty from universities access the data um, that or perhaps, you know, either access the data and or access the data who are conducting policy research. I'm sorry, can you ask that question one more time? Yes. I don't think I understood the last part. Can researchers from university access the data, and do you share data with faculty who are conducting policy research? Yes, we do. I think that that's a, that's a great question. I think we have some of our partners actually in this call today, so, so that's useful. Um, we are able to share data with those researchers. The workforce data can only be shared in aggregate format, so um, groups of, you know, a table, for example, we would be able to share. And then our education data is available at the individual level, but it is de-identified, and to have access to that, um, researchers, whether they're at a university or, or somewhere else, um, need to have IRB approval and then go through our MOU process. Okay, the last question. Um, is teacher mobility currently collected or will that be collected in the near future? This particular um, person is interested in teacher retention and churn um, as topics of interest for their research. Yes, that, that, that's some of the 
some of the most important data that, that we're currently collected, and we have some partners online right now that I know that are that are using some of those data. So we do collect that in terms of how teachers are moving from different school districts throughout the state of Kentucky, but also how they are entering and leaving the industry of education. So they may be teaching in a private K-12 setting, a public K-12 setting, or they may be working elsewhere in the state of Kentucky. So how we collect that data and then um, this idea of this master person to collect and, and produce data longitudinally allows us to see those mobility patterns actually uh, quite easily. Great. That was the last question we have um, for today, but thank you for answering all of those questions. I've also received comments as we were um, we were kind of discussing those questions from people who, who were appreciative of the answers and are um, really appreciated the information that was shared today. So, Lou, if you would like to explain um, the stakeholder feedback survey, I believe we are ready to wrap up the event. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. We really appreciate your time, and we hope you have found this to be a valuable hour and that we have, in fact, reached the goals of the webinar today, especially as it pertains to raising your awareness about the support that KSUS and the Kentucky Longitudinal Data System can provide at your school, your district, and your higher ed institution, et cetera. So as we finish today, when you click off the um, WebEx site, you will receive two um, requests for feedback. One is from Cisco WebEx about just the facility of using the WebEx service today, but the one that we're most interested in is a stakeholder feedback survey, that uh, a link to which will pop up when you finish today, when you close out today, and we would very, very much appreciate Another five or ten minutes on your part, if you would, please click on that link and give us feedback about the, the webinar today. I assure you that my team and I at Rail Appalachia will use those responses to um, improve on the webinar process as we move forward. So we would sincerely appreciate your time if you would complete that survey for us. Thank you again for joining us with us today, and a special thanks to Jennifer for the facilitation of the webinar, but especially to Kate and Justin and the great work that they do at KSUS. Thank you, everyone.